The next session will address a serious and important and growing issue. And the topic is the ethics and economics of kidney transplantation. We're privileged to have two wonderful thinkers on this topic. Dr. Gabriel Danovich is the medical director for the Kidney and Pancreas, Pancreas Transplant Program here at UCLA. He conducts laboratory and clinical research on immunosuppressive drugs and new immunosuppressive protocols and has been very active in the discussion, the international discussion of organ uh, trade. Dr. William Commoner is a professor of health policy and management and professor of economics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. At UCLA, he is the director of the research program on pharmaceutical economics and policy. The format of the debate will be this, that each presenter will make introductory remarks for four minutes to state the case. We will then turn to a discussion of the domestic market, and each will have seven minutes to make their case there. And then we will turn to a discussion of the international market, and each will have seven minutes to make their case there. We will conclude with Q&A from the audience, and when it comes time for that, we would ask you to line up at the two microphones and use the microphones. We are uh, recording this session. So let me begin the session by introducing Dr. Danovich. It's a pleasure to be here and to be with you, uh, Bill, uh, on, once again uh, at, at this venue and to see a fellow wonderful uh, crowd here today. So I actually called this part, uh, uh, for love of money, how best to address uh, the organ donor shortage, because indeed there is one. Uh, just to, I thought I would use this introductory session just to give people a little bit of background about organ donation and what it's about, kidney donation, in general terms. So the first successful organ transplant was actually in 1954, two identical twins at Harvard. The surgeon who did this procedure won the Nobel uh, Prize for it. These are two brothers, the Herrick brothers, who were the first very brave uh, brothers. One of them, the recipient, died after about 15 years. And the donor, uh, who I actually had the honor of, of meeting, died just a, a few uh, years ago. He was 79 years old, and he uh, had a, a, a lot of gratification of what he had done for his, for his brother. But what a lot of people don't know is that Ronald Herrick, uh, this guy on the upper guy, actually uh, in his last years was on a kidney machine. Uh, his remaining kidney had failed. Uh, and it's hard to know in retrospect whether or not, had he not donated a kidney to his brother, one, would he have ended up on, in, in a kidney machine, and two, whether he might have lived a few years longer. It's very hard to know that. We will never know that. But he had no regrets. Uh, he knew what he had done for his brother. Uh, and over the years, I've come across several patients uh, who have donated organs and then had to become recipients themselves. Uh, and in my experience anyway, although it's a very unfortunate thing, they haven't regretted it because of what they've done for their recipients. Uh, so this is a standard timeline. We started in 54. Not many people of you have identical twins. Uh, and because of work done at UCLA, actually, by Terasaki, whose funeral I will be going to this afternoon. The famous Paul Terasaki has a building on the campus here. Uh, uh, we began to do transplants from un un unrelated donors. You don't need to be closely matched. That's just something I would tell you. And that was a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because it led to the organ trade, which I know something that Bill would find uh, objectionable the, the, way, the way I do, trading in poor people. Uh, that's become a, 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 a blot, a stain on our work. This is exploitation of poor uh, vendors in, the, in India, and we have similar pictures uh, around, around the world. It's usually in third world and developing world country. So people say to me, is it safe to be an organ donor, a kidney donor? And the answer is, if done properly, it's safe. It's very safe. Is it totally safe? No. Whenever you uh, put someone to sleep and do an operation, there is danger associated with it. These are some numbers here. But more recently, more data has come out, and I don't have time to go into all of it, and I'm not going to show this in detail, to show that donating an organ, particularly in certain risk groups, um, uh, does seem to increase their risk of having kidney failure down the line, particularly young people, particularly young people. Uh, um, thank you for that two minutes. Particularly young people are at a greater risk over the long period of time, and interestingly enough, we know that poverty 
and chronic kidney disease are linked. The kidney disease tends to occur most commonly in poor people, and this is both in the emerging and in the in, in, in low risk, in, in, sorry, in the developing and, the, and in the developed world. This is a very important point, which I'll come back to. Um, how do we deal with this as doctors? Just to say that a donor is a patient. He is not a piece of meat or a piece of Lego. That is, organ donation from a kidney is not like taking a piece of Lego and sticking it back, back in. It's a complex procedure. It's a medical procedure with, with, with complications. And the reason, to my mind, as a physician, that I can look at myself in the, in the mirror in the morning and do this to healthy people is the living donor bargain because the donor has the benefit of seeing his recipient gain life and welfare. And there are umpteen data, multiple studies to show that when living donors donate under those circumstances, they get a benefit psychosocially in terms of their own sense of self-worth in seeing their own recipients do well. I won't have time to, to sit on this, but the opposite is true when people have donated under circumstances of financial gain only. And those who have donated for money, and there are many, much data to support this, in many parts of the world, they uniformly have depression, impaired self-worth, increased incidence of divorce, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I particularly showed this slide, because this slide comes from Iran, which is the one country that has, uh, that has uh, um, uh, a government-regulated a government regulated market. So I think I'll actually uh, stop there. Uh, uh, and um, OK, I'll stop there, because of time. <laughs> All right. I have a blank here. Wait a second. There we go. Well, we're really glad to be here. And this is a traveling roadshow for us because we've done it before. And it's fun to be with you again, Gabe. And um, we know what each other's going to say. It, none of this is a surprise, right? None of it at all. And um, it's not personal. Um, Dr. Danovich is clearly a distinguished represent, representative of his discipline. That's scary to say that. Distinguished comes before extinguished. There you go. <laughs> but the critical feature is it's not my discipline, right? And the debate that we're going to do, sort of, is not really between us. It's between our disciplines. It's between medicine on the one hand and economics on the other. And that's the critical thing that I want to sort of emphasize to you. Um, I have no doubt that more than 90% of the physicians and med students in this room and in the country would agree with Dr. Danovich because that's the culture of medicine. So I expect to be outvoted here 100 to 1. But I can tell you at the same time, which maybe you're not aware of, that well over 90% of all economists and economic students would agree with me. But there's probably nobody here. Is there anybody here who studies economics? No. Oh, there you go. We got one. Maybe two. Maybe three. So you can see the differences, right? So this is a hostile audience for me, but I'll try to manage it, all right? So the interesting question that I'd like to raise with you all is why this gap? Why this gap between our disciplines? Why is it that medicine sees the world so differently than economists do? And it's not the two of us, I would argue. It's, it's the principles which underlie our two different disciplines. So if you'll permit me, let me give you a, try to give you the beginning of an answer to that distinction, because that's really what I want to get, get across today, all right? <clears throat> um, now, I have a whole set of slides on the economics of transplantation. I would bore the death. I would bore the to tears, right? You'd all go to sleep, trust me. Now, if this was a small class, I would inflict upon you. 
and I would feel great glee in doing so. But I won't do that, all right? I will, instead of dealing with economics, I will bring you back to your undergraduate days. Because I suspect that many, if not most of you, I'm going to talk for Laura, for, for I suspect that many, although maybe most, maybe not, maybe most of you, had an old course in Western civilization, Western Civ, right? You all remember that, I hope. And I want to emphasize that there is a classic debate in Western thought which underlies what we're going to talk about today. And that classic debate is between equity on the one hand and utilitarianism on the other. What the hell is that? So let me, I have just a couple slides, and I'll go quickly. But let, me, let me try, see if I can get my slide here. Um, I need some help. I'm really not good at this. How do I, can some, put me on slide 19, please? And, and put the rest of the thing away, and there you go. And put the whole show. I'm really incompetent. Generally, I call my son. He's very good, but he puts me down. This is, this is better. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> Let me try to define these two terms really briefly, since I'm, I have to move quickly. All right? Equity requires that our bodies are sacred. That's what I say here, right? Oh, no, 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 no. We got the wrong. wrong. <laughs> Slide 19, please. There we go. All right. I don't have to read the slides to you. You can read them for yourselves. Well, I'm sorry. We have to restrict a little bit. Well, I have to go over this again, so I will come back to you whenever I can come back to you. Can you switch to my lot? I mean, if you need a kidney transplant and you had a choice of going to an economist or a doctor, uh, uh, let me think. Well, thank you for respond to that in a moment. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, developments in the United States. Yes, I won't go into the numbers, uh, as as we, Bill and I were sharing before. Yes, we have a long waiting list for kidneys. No question about it. About uh, I don't have a pointer here, but about oh yeah, we are of about 60, 70,000 people are waiting on what's called the active kidney transfer waiting list. It's too long. No question about it. I care for these patients waiting, and it's a problem. And some of them die on the waiting list. Yes, we've got a problem, no question about it. Uh, the other point that I'd like to make is that living donation, um, which counts about half of the kidney transplants, and these are just facts that are available, reached a peak. Reached a peak uh, in about 2008, and it actually fallen a little bit. It's interesting, that fall in 2008 coincided with the recession of 2008. And interesting enough data, and this has been validated, has shown that, that the fall off took place based on the socioeconomic status of, of, of the donors. That is, the lower the socioeconomic status uh, after 2008, there was this SES1, you know, this, this term, uh, that was less likely that they would donate. Now, I strongly suspect that poor people uh, don't love their family members any less than do more wealthy ones. But obviously, there were reasons, constraints, why they could not donate for financial reasons. Um, now, this issue of the market that we, we talked about and we'll be talking about is all over the newspapers, all over the newspapers, because it gives you fancy, you can fill halls on this debate. We're doing one today. And here we are. This is from Gary Becker, who's a famous economic, economic, he won the Nobel Prize for economics. Now, if you win the Nobel Prize for something, I'm not sure if there are any uh, people here who won Nobel Prizes, if you win the Nobel Prize for something, you are an expert on everything. Uh, uh, and so you get to say whatever you like. So he said, that, he said, there's, there's a clear remedy for the shortage of organ donors, pay them. 
Our conclusion is a very large number of live and cadaveric kidney donors will be available paying $15,000 for each organ. This is the front page of the, of the New York, of the Wall Street Journal uh, some time ago. Uh, no, 2014. And similarly, uh, we get Sally Sattel, who's also a protagonist of organ sales, saying we have to find ways to persuade more healthy young. This is very important. She's emphasizing on young people, because the young organs are better, young people to, to uh, donate kidneys to a stranger. A government entity or, which would offer them in-kind rewards, like paying for retirement or tax credit or, or tuition voucher, pay them to go to college, it's been, been mentioned. So help people go to college by, by getting them donate a kidney. That's, that's, that's a good thought. Well, let's think about that. So myself and a, a dear colleague, uh, Alex, Alex Capron, wrote an article in the LA Times, basically we're saying, do you really want to live in a country where for a poor person to go to college, he needs to sell a kidney? Is that the kind of society we want to live in? Or if you want to have a decent pension, because you don't have a pension, you have to sell an organ. Is that the society we want to live in? Let's ask ourselves that question. I don't think we do. And, and look at the numbers, they're very interesting. So uh, we had Gary Beck, who said 15,000, and just uh, a month ago, and you may be quoting this one soon, another colleague says, give him 45,000. Uh, and also... Who said that? Uh, held, he's an e <laughs> economist, an economist. Of course. The numbers go up, basically, 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 just get over it and pay for it, and also for deceased donors. Well, that gets complicated. We're gonna pay families of deceased donors, uh, and we have definition of death problems, and who's gonna get the money, and, and we can get into some dirty business. And, and a mutual friend of ours actually said, yeah, we could, young kidneys are better than old kidneys. So basically, young kidneys would get more money than older kidneys. So basically, we're turning the body into a meat market, a meat market. And different, you know, uh, lamb is more expensive than, uh, than, uh, uh, than sheep or veal or whatever. A uh, veal is more expensive than, than, than cattle uh, because, because it's a, a more tender meat. So we're going to say that a younger kidney, we need to give more than an older kidney. We're not turning people into, into, into meat. And the point is we are not helpless in the face of the organ donor. There's a lot more we can do in the face of this shortage rather than going down the, 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 the rabbit hole, the mine of paying, of paying poor people for their organs. There's much more we can do. We can pay for their expenses. We can all do this, and I'm not gonna go into detail because of time, we can all do this within the current law in the United States. We're not doing it. And instead of us having debates like this, to my mind, we should be working as one to do what we ought to do is making organ donation financially neutral so that people who want to donate to their family members and loved ones can do so without financial constraints. So here we are myself and some colleagues arguing that living and deceased organ donation should be financially neutral acts. They should be neutral. But the moment you get into payment, you end up, you end up uh, exploiting people. Uh, and and uh, since I have a more, two minutes remaining, I want to tell you this is what I call the, the, the unintended consequences of good intentions. So uh, Dr. Commodore and his colleagues may say, well, let's pay people. But I want to tell you something, that paying people doesn't add to the organ donor supply. It mainly replaces altruistic donation. And we've seen example of that all the time. You can't do them both together. And when I come to the international stuff, I'll show you. Payment undermines altruistic donation. It doesn't add to it. And this is an interesting example from the, in the US experience. Uh, this is donation to children in the United States. And donation to children in the United States was fairly steady levels. And the organ, and, and, and the organ community wanted to increase the number of organ donors to children. Now, most organ donors to children were parents, of course, uh, kidneys to parents. So a system was made so that we facilitated or allowed organs from deceased donors, of young deceased donors, to go to children and give them priority. So the kids would get priority for deceased donor organs. And indeed, the number of deceased donor organs to children went up. But what happened? Parental donation went down. So the moment that there was an option, even for parents donating to children, uh, the number of organs from parents went down when, the number of, when there was an option for deceased donation. So and there are examples of this all over, that when you provide people with payment, and I'll show you this from other countries when we come to the international part, you see that you undermine, you undermine 
the altruistic donation. You undermine current donation rather than, rather than helping it. And this, by the way, this undermining has a major impact on donation of hearts and livers and other organs because the kidney is just one of a package of organs we need to deal with. So be careful when these guys, my friends here, uh, 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 Mr. Trump, sorry, uh, Mr. Carl, Dr. Carmen, I'm sorry, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, it was a just, it was a mistake, a mistake. We all know what kind of mistake that was, Gabe, but it's okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. Call me Bernie Sanders if you want. It's all right. <laughs> all right, Bernie, you got it. Bernie dev never tells us how much it costs, right? But that's another story. All right, that's fine. That, and I can go. All right. All right. Strikingly for this debate, I agree with almost everything he said. But it doesn't change the basic principle which you learned in Western Civ, which is who makes a decision for an individual. And it's striking that he quoted Gary Becker, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and of course I agree with him. That makes my point that this is not a debate between the two of us, it's the debate between our disciplines. So if there's something you, you take away with you today, I want you to remember that particular point. It's the debate between our disciplines. Okay, that's what um, the problem with equity is it doesn't give us enough kidneys. We all know that there's something on the order of 60,000 uh, potential recipients on the active list, and we all know that even including the best we can do with cadaver uh, donations, uh, we're gonna get something on the order of 20,000, so it just doesn't do it. And to say we need to do better is not good enough. And I want to thank Dr. Danovich for giving me those numbers, because I don't know those numbers, and he does. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> utilitarianism is a different story. The emphasis in utilitarianism is that individuals make their own decisions. Now, you, don't, you can say, as Dr. Danovich says, we don't like to put people in these, in these circumstances that they have to, keep to, to make that decision. Fair enough. I agree with them on that. But if you can't change the whole world, do you let people make the decisions in the circumstances in which they find themselves? That's my question. All right? And, that is the st and that's the, the problem with utilitarianism. The problem with utilitarianism is, as Dr. Donovich says, and he's right, most of the donors would be, would, be more, would be poor, and most of the recipients would be rich. That, that is an issue. But I want to suggest to you, to take you back again to Western Civ, that this is not a new debate. This came for millennia. Many of you, hopefully all of you, read Plato when we were in college. And if you read The Republic, that's what it says. I took out my dog-eared copy from my college days, and that's where I found it, right? And it says that measuring utility to, or measuring welfare depends on the state, not the individual. That was Plato's position. And he said that, some of you remember, that who makes the decision? It's the philosopher king. You remember that? It was the philosopher king that would decide on the views of the state. Well, who is the philosopher king in this current debate? We all know the answer, it's the medical profession. Of course the docs like Plato because they're the philosopher kings. I would too. I like the Plato system when I'm the decider, but not otherwise, all right? The alternative, of course, is Jeremy Bentham. Lived a few thousand years afterwards, but still a major figure in Western thought. And that's what Jeremy said. You, there is no value to the society apart from the interests of the individual. And it's not the individual in principle, it's the individual in the circumstances in which he or she finds themselves. No. 
Hold on, I got one more thing to say, and then I'm going to sit, sit down and not be kicked off. All right? Dr. Danovich was an important figure in the Istanbul uh, of trans... That's correct, isn't it? You were an important figure in this declaration. <laughs> done, done. I, you should give credit where credit is due, all right? And that's what he says. At least that was my quote from this, all right? And I want to sit down because I don't like being kicked off, but I want to ask you to consider yourselves whether kidney donation can ever be a rational decision when you say, I'll give it for X dollars, but not for free. Can it ever be a rational decision? And what the current law does is say, you're not allowed to make that decision. You're not allowed, you go to jail if you make what seems to you to be a rational decision because some philosopher king said we don't want to live in that type of society. Who decides? The issue today is who decides? Your turn. Interesting, I was, as you were talking, thinking about what, what I think is missing here is that organs from paid donors and, and unpaid donors are not the same. They're much riskier if they come from paid donors because paid donors, when there's money involved, may not be telling the truth. You know that uh, we used to be able to pay for, um, for blood transfusions in the United States uh, and people would get paid for blood transfusions. They stopped doing that. And if you were to ask yourself, what would you prefer to get? A blood transfusion from an unpaid donor or a paid donor? What would you prefer? And I think just about everyone here would say, I want the unpaid one. Because maybe the unpaid one is not telling me the truth about their risk factors, which will impact on me. So just ask yourself that. The other question you might ask yourself, off the top of my head, how many people in this audience, if, um, if a loved one to them needed an organ, would donate that organ? And I would suspect that many, many of you would. Uh, if I ask you whether or not you would, uh, you, you would expect payment for that, I suspect that you, I suspect that you wouldn't. Um, so, indeed, the WHO uh, said, this is, I'm not talking about the international scene, in a few years ago when this problem of trafficking and exploitation of the poor, um, who are, by the way, truly not free to make the, the, the decisions that we make, and even if they would do, uh, make those organs much more risky because of the intrinsic distorting issue of money when it comes to medicine. Uh, to take measures to protect the poor and vulnerable from, from, uh, from uh, 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 organ trafficking. And I want to make this, because this has been shown over and over again, commercial living unrelated donation of, of the type that, that Bill is, is suggesting, displaces non-commercial living unrelated donation and comes at the expense of living related donation and deceased donation. It doesn't add to it. It takes away from it. Uh, and this has been shown over and over again. No country and I can provide you, if time, chapter and verse on many countries that permits or has permitted financial incentives for organ donation, openly or tacitly, has robust programs in related donation and non-commercial, and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Backlash, again, I don't have time to go into these, but I will talk about one interesting one because I'm very familiar with the situation in Israel. Uh, there was a time when Israelis would go in large numbers to the Philippines to get organ transplants. Um, uh, and of course they were getting them from poor Filipinos. And two things happened. Uh, and donation, by related donation, don donors in Israel was very low. Here, was very low. Oh, here, over here, was very low. In 2000, and people were going abroad, were going abroad to get transplants, mainly to the Philippines. And the Philippines were not only getting from Israelis, they were getting from other Gulf countries, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, two things happened. The Filipinos changed their law to say that their locals could not sell organs to foreigners. And the Israelis changed the law to make it very difficult for Israelis to go abroad. What happened as a result? Living donation in Israel doubled. Living donation in Israel doubled. And actually, oh, this didn't show up a slide here. This is from two days ago, last week, sorry, in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. Uh, the living donation in Israel has now increased another 30%. Just by virtue of the fact they stopped people going abroad, and they have removed some of the financial constraints 
to make the organ donation financially neutral. So uh, the idea that you're going to solve the problem by paying people is, fa is facile. It does the opposite. It undermines it. Iran, similarly, has been used a lot. In all the articles you'll see about organ donation, promoting organ donation, Iran is used because Iran has a government system of regulated market uh, that doesn't involve brokers and all of that. It's a government system. You're paid by a government entity. Um, and it turns out that living donation, unrelated donors, from fa uh, this is, these are all paid, the 73%. Uh, but living donation and deceased donation in Iran was very, was minimal. And interestingly enough, although it's quoted again and again that they wiped out their waiting list, they haven't. The waiting list in Iran, and this is Iranian data, is about the same numerically, and I'm not going to go over the numbers here, I can, you can vouch for it, as it is in the United States. So them paying hasn't solved the problem. It's made it worse for people who are waiting for hearts and livers because they don't go after them. It just doesn't happen. And the only areas in Iran that are doing well with respect to other organs from deceased donors are those areas in Iran, in Shiraz particularly, uh, where, where they've stopped paying, where they've stopped paying uh, 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 kidney donors. So uh, paying, does, it just doesn't solve the problem, even in a so-called regulated society. Uh, and uh, talking about the international thing, this is by a famous, uh, uh, the discussions we have in the United States, so this is all very nice for us to have this discussion, but this has impact internationally. This is a quote from, uh, uh, she's a famous anthropologist from, from Bangladesh. The categorization of countries into developed and developing is facile. And to think that having a trial of living donate, donor financial incentives in the so-called developed world would, have, would not have a dangerous impact on the developing world is nothing short of arrogance. Um, this is a, a slide of a friend of mine, a colleague, who actually is pro-payments. And he's worried about the international ramifications of doing this. What are the international ramifications of permitting this, uh, this <laughs> thank you, of permitting uh, payments? Uh, you might say, oh, we'll have it in the United States. Well, the rest of the world is watching us, and what's going to stop people from running around the world to get the best price? Uh, even get the shorter, a lower price? Or people coming, how, how are you going to stop that? And this is, I'm not going to go over this slide. All I can say is for him, this is a protagonist of organ payments. To have a system he feels comfortable with, you would need world peace. And I want to tell you something, we're not quite there yet. We're not quite there yet. Maybe soon, maybe soon, we're not quite there yet. He made this point in answer to, a, to, to, uh, uh, to a, uh, uh, an article I wrote, a regulated system of incentives such could only be in countries that can meet the highest standards of ethics and patient protection. In other words, we divide the world up into ethical countries and non-ethical countries. And all the non-ethical countries will get up and say, no, we're not ethical, we can't do it. And the ethical countries are, we're ethical, we can't do it. Come on, who are you kidding here? It would cause chaos internationally and, uh, and terrible problems in the development of ethical and healthy organ donation in, in poor and developing world. What fun. Um, I only have a little bit of time, so first I want to emphasize two things. First, being an economist, of course, I think the government does not take priority over supply and demand. Of course economists believe that, and it's even true, because supply and demand depends on the actions of individuals in their own particular circumstances. And that's why we have black markets. Governments say markets, you know, shouldn't exist, but guess what? We have black markets because even in those circumstances, supply and demand rules. That it's true that it's illegal, but uh, Dr. Danovich would acknowledge, I think, that there is, even today, a substantial black market in kidneys, right? So that's my point. But let me make just a little bit more about try to rebut what he said. On the large part, I agree with him. He says that, um, <clears throat> that if you have paid donations, you'll have fewer altruistic donations. That's your point. And I'm probably correct. But that's not the issue. The issue is if we pay enough, we'll get enough donations paid 
to eliminate the, um, eliminate the backlog. Remember the backlogs. Keep in mind the idea that we have 60,000 people who need kidneys, and many will die without it. And we're only getting on the order of 20,000 kidneys a year, um, cadaver and uh, live. Just keep that in mind. And there is an, an amount we could pay that would eliminate the backlog. So it's, it's incorrect to say that that uh, negative relationship between altruistic and paid donations means that we can't eliminate the backlog. We definitely can. That doesn't follow. At least that's what I would argue, and we can discuss it further. All right? Second, um, kidneys are a wonderful commodity because nobody can just take it out of your body and sell it. It's not so easy to do, right? It can only be done in a, in a hospital. So it would be certainly reasonable to say that do paid donations could only exist in a first-rate hospital. You decide what that means. And then it would be reasonable to say that it would be maintained at least as safely as it would be done with, a, with an altruistic um, donation. And it would also be reasonable to assume that, um, the, that the donor would be informed about all the pros and cons of the donation. What is striking about Dr. Danovich's position is that he seems much more concerned with the donor than the recipient. If you, the, the issue is whether the donor will be exploited from his viewpoint. And while that's an important issue, it's not the only issue. We also have to keep in mind the idea of how many people die when they're on the waiting list and uh, uh, other types of treatment don't, don't work. So that it's not as you, just to say we need to do better with altruism doesn't fit it in my judgment. And that's, that probably is the single largest uh, distinction between our positions. All right, Dave, your turn. I hate to tell you, Bill, one thing, you know. Um, no, you don't. You don't hate to tell me that at all. We're not in the business of human sacrifice. Look, we're not in the business Even of... Even if individuals make their own sacrifice? Well, let's that's see. That's the issue. That's Plato's philosopher so, king. Free people, uncoerced by life's vicissitudes, do not sell their kidneys or donate them for financial consideration. Who says that? I'm saying that. I don't say that. <laughs> Dave, do we... No, this let's is respect, good. Let's respect this the rules. Good. I would like to respect the rules of the debate. If we reach your head down there. Sorry. Uh, and uh, you'll, have your, you'll have the final word, Dr. And, and uh, I, I know in this audience of free people here, uh, that, may, that I just think part, just about everyone would donate a kidney if, if, if necessary. And I hope none of you would ever be in a situation that you're at such a degree of poverty that you would uh, be forced to donate. And in those circumstances, by the way, uh, I'm not sure that I want that kidney because the outcomes are poor, both for the donors and the recipients, for the reasons I mentioned earlier on. Uh, but this is the kind of question that people like Bill ask. Is it more ethical to let people die on the list or compensate living donors? I mean, that's a question that's been asked. And I would say it's a non sequitur. It's a non sequitur. We are not in the business of human sacrifice. This is an article I wrote. Uh, many of you might know the Declaration of Helsinki. The Declaration of Helsinki is a core value in, in clinical research. Core value, and it came after the exploitation of Jews in concentration camps in, by the Nazis in the Second World War, uh, by, by African Americans by, uh, in the United States uh, at Tuskegee in the, in the 50s. By, uh, by Guatemala, by Americans also, the exploitation of poor people for, in clinical research. And what the, what the Declaration of Helsinki says is considerations related to the well-being of the human subject should take precedence over the interests of society and, and, uh, and science. We're not in the business of human sacrifice. 
We're not in the business of solving one person's problem by making a problem for something else. Yes, we could solve the organ donor shortage by taking everyone in this room and taking out a kidney, not even asking them. But that's, we can't do that. And we're not going to do that. We can't do that. Not in a, any decent human society. Uh, and I've said for some time that all, all this discussion about organ donation uh, by payment, vending, is a Trojan horse. It just undermines ethical organ transportation and ethical behavior. We are responsible for donors as patients, just as if we are responsible for recipients. I care about them both equally, because they are humans and they're patients, and I'm responsible for their welfare, and it's not my job to solve one person's problem on the back of another. But in terms of what we can do about that, to my mind, the answer will never come from supply. So back to economics. I don't think you can solve this problem by supply. To my mind, the answer will come if there is going to be an answer, and it's not easy, by demand. Let me just tell you something. The need for liver transplants is going down because we have new drugs, fantastic new drugs against hepatitis C, that will hopefully cut down the need for liver transplants. The need for heart transplants is going down, not because we have more donors, but because we have better treatment of heart failure and new fancy heart devices to assist the heart uh, by impacting demand. And to my mind, we will get towards a solution to the kidney shortage by addressing the demand for kidney transplants. And we can say for the first time, it's an article from the New York, from the New York Times last year, the number of new diabetic cases in the United States is beginning to come down. It's beginning to come down. Now, we have a long way to go. But this is where the answer, if there is to be an answer, will come from, from demand and not from supply. We'll never, 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 never do it by supply unless we address the demand. So let me just say, let's just uh, declaration. I won't go into that. So let me say one final thought uh, for the new year. If you plan, any of you, to get chronic kidney disease, which I hope you won't, <laughs> just ensure you're surrounded by loving and compatible family and friends. Uh, and it's probably not a bad idea, even if your kidney function is normal. So thank you very much. <laughs>
and it's not, and, and economics, I don't deny the importance of economics, but we're dealing with human beings, and we're dealing with their welfare, and medicine is about welfare. Let me just say one thing. People have said, well, no, we, sent, we, we sent people, all right, all right. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Danovich is the philosopher king, and it's true that if I had to choose a philosopher king, I would choose you, but I would rather choose myself or any individual in this room to make their own judgments for themselves, because I'm a devoter, devote, I follow Bentham, not Plato. And that choice from your Western Civ course as an undergraduate is that which underlies everything that we're dealing with today. It's not medicine independent of everything else. Medicine is terribly important, but medicine doesn't tell, make the decision as to whether or not you'd be willing to bear the risk in return for the payment of any given procedure. The docs say, it's really up to you whether you want this procedure or not. I assume you've said that to, to some of your patients. And, but you have to believe it. You have to believe it. It's up to the patient. Not the doc. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Bill, if you had the opportunity of, if you needed, God forbid, a kidney transplant, and you could choose between getting one from a desperate poor pe person who, who needed in order to, uh, uh, for one reason, or to get it from uh, uh, altruism, who, who, whose kidney would you prefer? I would go to my surgeon and said, are they really the same? And, the, and I would listen to the surgeon. Suppose the surgeon said, they're the same. Suppose the, the, your physician says, a branded drug and a generic drug are the same. It depends on whether you believe your doc. And if you believe your doc in one case, maybe you should believe your doc in the other. <laughs> Thank you for a, a very uh, interesting and spirited debate. Um, those of uh, who, people who would like to ask questions, you can line up at the microphones. If you, I would ask that uh, you keep, in the interest of maximizing the number of questions, I would ask to keep your questions short and to make them questions, not statements. And uh, I would ask that the uh, responders also keep their responses relatively, relatively short. Um, let me uh, let me begin, and I would also ask when you uh, when you approach the mic and, and have the opportunity to speak that you uh, give your name and and, and affiliation. Uh, let me ask a question: um, This issue of altruism versus uh, economic uh, remuneration. Do you see it extending beyond kidney transplantation and? perhaps being debated in other areas of medicine. Uh, give me an example. Well, you'd mentioned blood donation. I, when I was a starving student, I did sell my blood. Um, I remember those days. And um, it would, it would obviously other organs that are irreplaceable, they're, they're, you don't have two of, you can't donate. Could you donate one eye? Uh, could you? But I think, you know, the eye issue is interesting because no, I don't think any, any, you wouldn't want to go to a doctor who'd be prepared to take out someone's eye for money. Uh, and you wouldn't want to go to a doctor who says, uh, I, I take my hand, you know? So that's what I mean. We're not in the business of human sacrifice. That's not what medicine, that's not what medicine is about. Medicine is about promoting health and advocacy. And, and that applies to everyone. Uh, another analogy that's used, oh, we send people to the Iraq. We send people to war. Society sent, yes, send pe people send people to war. That's true, but doctors don't send people to war. The society decided to, that's not medicine. I, as a doctor, would not send someone to a life-threatening situation. That's not what medicine is about. And we, as doctors, are responsible for all patients. Donors and recipients are human beings who need to be treated with respect, and their welfare needs to be protected. That's what medicine is about. Please. I agree with, doc with Dr. Danovich in everything he just said. Medicine is about Docs making decisions for people. Medicine is about docs playing 
the role of Plato's philosopher king. Please take that away from, with you today. So we'll start on the left, go to the right, left, right, left, right. Please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaminoran. Uh, introduce yourself, please. Oh, my name is Sri Ralabandi. Um, I'm working. I'm not a student, but I will be hopefully soon. I um, can't hear you. <laughs> I, okay, yeah. So my question was that along the same lines of other organ donations, um, what about surrogacy? Um, what about what? Surrogacy, like no. um, getting mothers in developing countries to deliver a baby and then taking that baby away. Um, I they guess get what paid, they, don't they? They get paid, yes. Right. Um, why is, that's legal. What? That's legal. Right. So I guess I wanted you guys to explore the, you know, behind that, because the mother's life is at risk, and it does fall outside the jurisdiction of traditional medicine, usually. Then your question is really to Dr. Yeah. Danovich, because yes, it is. I think that's, that follows the principle that individuals should make decisions for their own bodies, not docs. Yeah, surrogacy is a very interesting analogy, actually. A very interesting and a, a challenge, and a challenging one. Um, paid surrogacy, uh, is illegal in many parts of the United States. In certain states, it, uh, um, uh, all this reproductive law is, is kind of chaotic in the United States. Uh, it's all over the place. Uh, but paid surrogacy is illegal in many parts, but not all. In India, you're right, and in Pakistan, they have these um, uh, surrogacy shops. And, and you see these poor women basically sitting there, getting in inseminated uh, to, to carry other wealthy people's, uh, and it's, it's not pretty. Uh, the New York Times had a, uh, had a piece on it about two years ago. I have a slide in there. I actually didn't have to actually show on, on, on these women and what kind of lives they lead. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, do, do you want to go there? I, I don't think we want to go there. Uh, I, I really don't think we should promote that. Uh, and, uh, and again, I won't go into this whole argue about replacement, but I don't think we, we would want to see a world where we see poor people, basically the only thing they have to sell is their uterus or their kidneys. Please. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Whitney Camarena. Um, my question um, has to relate to sort of the theory behind the idea of rationality. Um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the functionalist theorist, uh, Rostow, and he basically talks about immigration. Um, and the idea is that for a system to work where that payment would be rational, you have to assume that perfect rationality. So I guess, and you um, mentioned too that poor people would most likely be the donors. Um, do you think that we, as we are today, can assume perfect rationality from low SES people and is it possible to avoid, I guess, the exploitation of them? Is that, is that a free rational choice if you need that money to live? I, 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 I actually, I, I'm not, I think I got your question right. I think that poor people who are desperate, I think uh, we, we cannot expect them to make necessary rational decisions about what their health is going to be in 40, 50 uh, uh, years from now. Because that's not a, it's not a, it's not a free, it's not a free decision that they're, they're able to make. And again, I repeat, is that a society we want to live in? that for a poor person in order to pay for their mortgage. And this was actually suggested once in the Wall Street Journal. At the time of the mortgage crisis, people could solve their mortgage payments by selling organs. Now, is that, is that our response to our society, that because you're foreclosing your house, you're gonna sell an organ? It's just not, it's just, that, that's not a society any of us would wanna live in, because we know it's, in addition to the exploitive part, let's say I'm being, uh, I'm being uh, a fuzzy wuzzy liberal, with this uh, uh, exploitive part. Never. I would say, God forbid, I would say, I would say that there's also a medical issue because time and time again, we know that the organs from these patients are dangerous because people don't always tell the truth. And the question I asked you before about where the, which organ you would take, I had slides which I didn't have to show, is that in order for organ donation and medicine generally to be successful, you have to have a sense of trust between the doctor and, there's, and, 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 the, and the patient. Not everything you can tell by an exam or, or lab test, you can't. You need to know if someone's having high risk sex or has a family history of this or that or is taking medications or drugs, you can't tell. You need to ask them. 
And once you introduce money into the equation, that trust is undermined. And we've seen that happen, examples of it over and over again, where even in the so-called regulated system in Iran, where there's a government, and it's done in a hospital, not in some back clinic, we find that the outcome for the recipients is worse, and the outcome for the donors is worse, because this trust issue is lost. And that take away the issue of, of whether poor people can make decisions or not. Is, there, is that it undermines the actual medical process of trust that is critical for good medical care. Undue influence. Dr. Commoner. So, my turn? Please. Good. Um, you don't need perfect rationality to make decisions. None of us make decisions on perfection. We make decisions on the best basis that we can. We take our car in to be, to be uh, repaired. We don't have perfect rationality as to whether the part is needed. So it's no different than so many parts of human life. But I want to talk more about this trust issue because I hear it so often. If you let awful, dirty dollars involved, that does away with trust. Nonsense. Dollars represent the mechanism for exchange. And that doesn't mean there can't be trust at the same time. To say that if dollars are involved, there is no trust is to eliminate the whole basis of a market economy. And that says that we only can live in a society where the philosopher king makes his decisions for us. And that's not a society in which I want to live in. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Hai Young. I'm a Pfizer student at UCLA. I had a question for Dr. Donovich. Um, you talked about how um, young population, uh, young donors are more prone to or vulnerable to um, uh, getting, you know, kidney failure after donation. Could you talk more in detail about that? Do we have data on you know, how, what percentage of the young donors actually develop um, kidney failures after you know, donating their kidneys? Because I think that's a critical point. And we're dealing with the question of whether it's moral to um, allow young people or you know, the po uh, poor population um, to you know, donate their, their organs and expose them to ex expose themselves to more diseases for economic issues um, yeah, that's a very good very good question it's a question that's currently under intensive research and debate in the in the in the transparent community so the incidence of kidney failure among donors is very small so let, let me get that straight it's very small mm -hmm. but it's not it's not it's not it's not a nothing um, it's small in absolute terms but in relative terms Younger people, because they have a longer life, to many more years ahead of them, uh, have a greater risk because they have so many more years. And we now know also, as I mentioned before, that the poor and the privileged in different societies and ethnic minorities, African Americans and Hispanics, particularly because of high incidence of diabetes in Hispanic families uh, and hypertension in African American families, particularly, are, are a greater risk. So there is some question about whether or not uh, young, uh, uh, young, poor. And, and, and African Americans and, and, uh, and Hispanics uh, should, should be organ donors. And it's something that we face, actually, in our program uh, all the time. These are di difficult, difficult dilemmas. At least we can say to someone who's donating to a spouse or to a loved one that whatever risk they're taking is, can be balanced by the benefit they're seeing in their, in their, in their lives. If, they, if, they're, if they can now bear children, and they can now uh, have a spouse and lead a life and work, then, then you could say, yes, the family unit has been improved. But it's an it's a ethical question that we are, we are faced with all the time. And, and this is a, a, an issue that is of intense concern, even among, even in altruistic donation. I'd be particularly concerned if we were to have paid donation, because they, they don't have the benefit of seeing the welfare of the people that they love as a balance for the risk that they're taking in terms of their overall welfare. Dr. Commoner. That's a really good point. And Dr. Danovich makes it clearly that donors have a balance between the risk and what they obtain from it in terms of 
family structure. But that's not the only gain we get. We get a gain from dollars. Dollars are worth something to all of us. And to ignore that reality is to ignore so much. So we all balance risks and rewards, and this is just part of that. Yeah, but it, I would say it's not the function of, of medicine, in, in the narrow or the broad sense, to solve people's financial problems by, by utilizing pieces of their body. That's not, that's not what it's about. That's not medicine, but that's life. And the issue is whether that life, medicine is a part of life or is all of life. And I would argue it's just part of life. Please. Um, my name is Yen, and I'm a nursing student from UCLA. I'm sorry, I can't um, hear you. What year are you? I am in my second year of my master. In She's a ma in the master's of nursing program at UCLA, yeah. second year. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so my question for both of you is, is there a way for, for, for you to supply, to increase the, the de to sup increase the supply for the demand of kidney transplants without um, associating it with financial reasons, like a different system of incentivizing the transplant, uh, you know, the, the, the donor system? So you're asking what other options might there be? Yes. Look, there are options, but I, I will be frank. I'm not sure they're adequate. I've been saying this quite, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite honestly. Yes, we can do better. And I feel strongly that we need to address what we call the financial disincentives. That is, for people who can't travel, it's expensive to be an organ donor in the United States. It doesn't need to be. Uh, we should be able to pay for people's travel, for the hotel expenses, for all the things. So it should be financially neutral for them. We can also hopefully do better with deceased donation. So yes, we can do better. But I want to be, I want to be quite frank. Saying I don't think that even by doing better, we're going to answer the problem through supply. The, if there is to be an answer in the big picture over the years, it will come from demand. I think that concludes this session. We are out of time. I want to thank both Dr. Denovich and Dr. Commoner for being with us today. I think you've raised many, many important issues. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>